you don't want to jump in there right now. We'll go further. Hey, thanks for joining me today. Um, had some technical issues as far as getting that uh, experience from Hawaii done. Uh, I'll get a hold of Gabe and, and get it re-recorded. I don't know what happened, but all the files were corrupted for some reason. I think the GoPro 10, the processing chip, once it overheats and gets too hot, it just turns into crap. But anyway, we'll, we'll get that fixed. Um, what I wanted to share with you today uh, comes from Jonah. Jonah shared this with me uh last year uh just to share it just to he didn't want it you know shared publicly and what have you but he reached out touched base with me uh reshared the story with me and uh gave me permission to share it with y'all so that's what i'm gonna do um this this particular instance uh, jonah just retired at uh 63 years old and this was his uncle's story that he heard several, several times as a kid and has been to this cabin. Uh, it's outside of Prince of Wales Island uh, on another little remote island, unspecified. So this particular cabin his uncle built, he built it in stages. The first part was just a very small shanty shack. Uh, just just big enough for a old drum converted into a wood stove and and basically just dried in enclosure and as he built onto it it ended up having slab wood on the outside so what slab wood is is how it sounds slabs of wood uh, when you have one of those portable sawmills and you cut them into you know dimensional lumber you get pieces of slab and what ends up happening is you stack them like this and then you stack other ones to fill the gaps and so <laughs> he had that and you know he'd been at the place approximately uh, going on 15 years you know uh spending a lot of time except winters winters he would uh go out of state for his regular job work that regular job and just spend the rest of the time back up here in alaska well it was approximately in his 10th year there that strange thing started happening. He noticed that when he would get there in the early spring, in the mornings he was greeted by these scream type howls off in the distance. And he just thought it was odd. And he was like, I've never, never quite heard that before, but you know, it's probably just some random animal caught in a trap or, or just it's mating call at spring or something. You know, he, he was just kind of excusing it away. So Jonah's uncle just continued like that for the next couple of years. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> ah. Being out in the cold, wet rain. Anyway, a little tickle in the back of the throat. <coughs> so, his uncle, after a couple of years of that, he'd hear those screams in the, in the spring and then again in the fall just before he was getting ready to head back out of state for his, his regular job. Now, uh, his uncle was an independent contractor. He didn't get into what, um, but that's how he made his money working independently out of state. And so after about two, three years of that, his uncle said the way he set up his cabin was kind of like a, it was a little bit L-shaped. And what I mean by that is it, standard, he said it was 14 foot wide, 22 foot long. And then if you're facing the front door off to the left hand side on the back side was an addition made as a, a, a bedroom, right? So that's why it had kind of an L shape to it. He, and over the years of building on it from starting one, one size and then expanding out and then expanding some more, uh, he ended up with a few nine inch window panes just here and there uh, to allow light in, right? And they're, you know, I mean, they're nine inch little windows, you know, just simple ones. Well, one of these particular windows ended up being in a spot where he ended up putting a, a wood stove. So the window is partially obscured by the stovepipe going out through the roof. And from what he was telling me, his uncle, where he would sit at this little table. So if you go inside the door, you, first, you had to go up about six steps up onto a very, very small deck, very small, uh, big enough for a lawn chair type chair and a tiny card table 
or setting drinks down or whatever. Very small. So you get up, you go inside the door, which was centered. There was two of those nine inch windows on the front side. And when you go inside, there was a table immediately to your left, uh, kind of like a sink to your right that just kind of drained straight out into the floor onto the ground. And straight ahead would be that wood stove, some cabinets on the right, and then the little doorway on that left to that little bedroom of his. And behind that wood stove was one of those nine inch windows. So he said his, his uncle had a spot where he would sit at that table and eat his meal. Now, uh, the outside of the nine inch windows, there was a bigger window in the bedroom and a bigger window on the right hand side, just past the little sink area, but before the back corner. So, and he said the, the other windows were just two foot by two foot, not very big, just let light into place, right? And his uncle had curtains over each and every one except the nine inch window behind the wood stove because it was obscured all the time. It, there was no need. And plus he was so isolated. He didn't have neighbors at the time. He had no neighbors. So as he's sitting there eating, uh, Jonah said his uncle would, would tell the story that his uncle's eating and he's hearing a weird, almost like rain dropping on a one spot, just thump 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 but just kind of like a weird drip noise he's trying to kind of confused by it and he's just kind of looking around he's like what's what's leaking you know i know the roof is good i took my time doing the roof i know the roof is good what's leaking you know so he gets up and he starts looking around now it's just before dark as this is going on as he's going around looking around he's trying to figure out where's this where's this leak coming from and he passes by from the, the window on the right-hand side, just past the sink. He's crossing the cab and going back into the bedroom area to look for this leak, right? As he's going by, he passes right in front of that wood stove. And out of the corner of his eye, he notices something move out of that nine-inch window space. So immediately he's startled. He jumps back. He's kind of trying to look out the window. What the hell was that? Trying to look to see if maybe it was a tree. And just by his movement made it look like something was moving. But there was nothing there. It was just part of a little hill that was just back behind the cabin. So his uncle immediately armed himself and went out down the little steps, went around the back of the cabin looking for whatever was in the window. Seeing nothing, hearing nothing off in the distance or moving around, just eerily quiet. He comes back inside and just kind of looks out each window again and just kind of shrugs it off and continues to eat. The dripping sound stopped and... After he's done eating and he puts his stuff into the sink, his uncle told him that he kept feeling like he was being watched and he got hyper paranoid about that little window in the back behind that little stovepipe because that's where he saw the movement and that's where the feeling of being watched was coming from. But every time he'd look, he wouldn't see anything there. So he decides, I'm going to get one of these old dish rags, one of these hand towels, and pin it up over the window. And it's getting into dark at this point. Uh... It was early spring when this happened, so there was still, it wasn't quite land of the midnight sun yet. It was working towards it. We were gaining daylight during those times, you know, in the spring. <laughs> so, as he's tacking up this hand towel, Jonah said his uncle, when he was doing that, he started hearing that dripping noise again, and he could hear it coming from his left off into that little bedroom area. And because of what he dealt with earlier, with that dripping sound and then something moving, he was putting two and two together. And he started feeling like he was being toyed with. Uh, finished tacking up the little hand towel. Turned around walked into that bedroom. And he said uh, his uncle used to always pause for a long time when he was telling this, this portion of it. Because he, he walks into the bedroom. And immediately he was overcome by fear and dread. And, and knelt down. Like squatted down. And was leaning in, in the doorway against the, the door frame. Right? As he's doing so. Now remember, the only exterior walls, all they are is some old rough cut lumber, dimensional timbers for studs, and these slabs nailed to it. Boom, 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 boom. That's, that's all it is. Um, outside of the main living area where there was some plywood underneath, but the rest of it was built with the slab wood because he, he brought a little portable type of... Uh, 
you know, dimensional lumber saw that ran on a track. Uh, basically a big band saw if you guys never seen them. And uh, he had bought it used and used it up until it died and uh, used those pieces of slab to, you know, make the exterior for that little cabin. So as he's sitting there leaning, feeling sick, just this hellacious banging starts just below the window. The window he had in that room, just two foot by two foot, was above the bed. And that banging was just below it. Now, that portion of the cabin is pretty close to ground level at the floor. Uh, it was elevated a little bit just because down in southeast there, uh, a lot of the properties there are, it immediately goes from beach to elevation just instantly. <laughs> so he happened to have a place that had a little less of the fjord-like steepness, but enough to where it was still... Uh, on uh, pilings in the front kind of like little stilts in the front for the very front of it the first 10 feet of it or so and the rest of it was right back on this type of landing like a little step shelf so as he's leaning against that doorway the banging started and he, every time it was banging uh, his he said his uncle would say he got scared and scared and finally uh being crippled from fear for a moment he snapped out of it got his shotgun went out the door and immediately stepped onto the little deck, knocking over his little chair and card table to get to the edge of the deck to see around the corner towards that little space from the outside. Uh, he just started pumping rounds into the air. Boom, boom, boom. Went right back inside, shut the door. And he said, uh, his uncle would say he couldn't stop shaking. He sat at that table and was just shaking and didn't understand why. Uh, just just couldn't understand it was something uh, was oppressive towards him he gets calmed down after a little while and it's on in the dark uh, and he knows he needs to light his lantern so he can have some light to see so he gets up he crosses the little room and grabs the little lantern off the little sink area right and he lights the lantern sets it on the table Sits it there for a minute as he's trying to figure out what he's doing. He he said that uh, his uncle was confused at the time, according to what his uncle was saying. He felt like he had 10 things to do but couldn't figure out what they were. It was the type of confusion he was dealing with. So he realized, you know, I just ran rounds through my shotgun. I should reload it. So he starts looking around for his shotgun shells. Well, his shotgun shells were right on the table in a bowl in front of him. He, however, being in this confused state, was wandering around the cab and looking in all these obscure places where the ammo would never be. So after doing that for a little bit, it dawns on him, it's right on the table in front of you where you're sitting, you know. So he sits back down, he calms himself down and reloads the shotgun and attempts to go back into his room. And again, as soon as he crosses in through that, that little doorway, he's immediately gripped by fear. And he's like, man, what, this, something ain't right. So he backs out, goes, sits back at the table, and he's, he's contemplating, why is this happening? You know, just, just going through it in his mind. What, what, what is this? Is this some kind, did I eat something bad? Am I having hallucinations from bad food? Some kind of food poisoning? Well, up to this point, he's only assumed he saw something move in front of a window. There was banging going on. And he's basically freaked out. He has nothing seriously tangible outside of potential hallucinations. Because he's second guessing everything going on in his world at that moment. So according to what Jonah was saying. Uh, his uncle stayed like that for at least a day. Sitting at that table. Uh, the, the lamp eventually went out. He just sat there in the dark. Just was in a confused state. And after that evening had passed and about midday the next day he was finally coming back into his own senses and 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 whatnot and as he was doing so uh he got that overwhelming sense of fear again and so he stands up he looks around he's not seeing anything so it being light outside he started flipping the curtains over which were just old towels and old pieces of cloth that were just tacked over the window so he was just taking them and tucking them over the top and just so you know light could shine in so he goes and opens them all up right and as he's doing so uh he keeps noticing 
after he passes each window, almost like a dark shadow was moving as well. But it, it, he just chalked it up as you're just paranoid from what's been going on. There's there's nothing following you around this cabin to each window that you're opening and just to make a shadow right after you pass it. You know, very confusing to him. So he ends up back in his bedroom. No fear this time when he gets through the through the threshold, goes over, opens that window up and is just kind of looking at it for a moment. Instead of turning and walking off like he had done all the other previous windows, he kind of stood there just looking out. Well, as he's doing so, this figure comes in front of him and then immediately cuts back out. Uh, according to what his uncle said, the figure was so large that uh, it took up all the window and he only saw hair and then no hair. I mean, it was it was so big. So immediately he stumbles back, falls down, scurries out of the little room, grabs his shotgun, and runs outside to go and get this whatever he was assuming. It was probably a bear stalking him to eat him, and that's why he was so scared. He gets outside, nothing around. As he gets up to the back side to where his room is, that little extended room is, he hears thrashing through the trees going off and up the mountain, right? So he calms down a little bit, goes, okay... Bear knows I'm willing to defend myself. It'll probably stay away. There, there's going to be fish in the stream soon. You know, everything, will be, this bear will stay away. And then to him, in his own mind, he's like, oh, that makes sense. There's a big bear, big predator around. No wonder I'm feeling antsy. I just, you know, I'm used to seeing him and I don't feel as antsy. But I guess me not seeing it and just sensing the predator is what made me scared. So he chalked it up. Went inside, felt a lot better, was a lot calmer. And continued on with his day doing his stuff. Kept aware that that bear could be out there and would listen every once in a while before he'd go out into the yard and, and tend to the outboard and do some other stuff on his old skiff. So that day passes and a couple more pass with no incident whatsoever uh, to where his uncle is calm. Just being out in the woods, he's back to his norm, calm self, enjoying, just loving being there in the isolation and, and you know his own area. So he ends up down at the beach down below his cabin. And he's basically beach combing, and periodically they'd come across, you know, the glass balls from the Korean fishing boats, you know, with the with the uh, brailer mesh over them and stuff like that. Sometimes he'd find washed up dead marine life, you know, just he was enjoying the whole reason he had built a cabin there. So as he's going about this just happy-go-lucky, no issues, you know, no, no feelings of dread. He always had a shotgun with him. No feelings of dread or anything. He gets about 100 yards down the beach and the tide's starting to come in. And so he knows he's got about 20 minutes to get back past this certain group of rocks to where the, the shoreline cuts up in further where the tide doesn't quite reach. So he has safe walking, right? So as he's going back towards this spot, these rocks that are the marker for him to know that, hey, once I get past these rocks to my left, I will be above high tide mark and I won't have to worry about getting caught you know, out in the tide and having to hike through all this dense crap. A lot of Devil's Club and some other stuff in the area. So, <clears throat> as he comes and cuts back around these rocks, uh, it's a, you know, the bank is obviously, you know, it's got a cut edge kind of where it's dug underneath and some of the vegetation is hanging over and there's some trees leaning out and stuff like that that he had cut off and there's just some stumps and stuff there. Well, as he comes around the rocks, he notices... A bigger stump than he knows is there so he stops and he notices it out of the corner of his eye and he slowly turns and looks and he said the stump was very large it was kind of a cinnamon brownish color and it was very large but it it had the appearance of a tree stump at the distance which was less than 50 yards uh, he, he hesitated for a moment and then just kind of continued walking thinking okay bears don't look like tree stumps bears will just sit there and look at you they, they don't try to mask themselves in any way bears aren't that cunning so he walks down and he knows he's got another eh, roughly 100 yards or so before the trail that cuts back up to his cabin so as he's walking along getting more and more paranoid by the step and getting more and more uh fear amplified he's walking along and out of the corner of his eye, he's just kind of every once in a while just kind of glancing, not fully turning his head, but just kind of glancing off. Uh, at one point, he glanced over and 
he saw this thing in the tree line walking along just not stride for stride because it was far larger than him but it was it was keeping pace with him but just offset behind him a little ways so he makes it up to the trail and he knows this thing is there so when he comes around the little corner of brush and stuff to get up on the truck because he had to climb the bank a little bit he had put some old you know uh, driftwood stuff up against that little part of the bank to make kind of like a stairway and it, it wasn't the best but it worked for what it was right so he's negotiating that going up it he gets up it and he knows this thing's going to be right off to his left so when he gets up to the top he's pointing the shock in that direction nothing there absolutely nothing because once you break past that you know initial thick brush at the shoreline it opens up a little bit you know so once he got past that point he had the shotgun ready nothing there no sign of anything so he's like holy crap I, i'm i'm driving myself crazy with this crap kind of chuckles to himself it's like i'm imagining stuff i need to i just need to take a break i'm gonna i'm gonna go you know visit relatives prince wells island we'll just we'll, i'll go over there and, and go visit for a little while and, and clear my mind of this stuff so he walks up to the cabin gathers up a bunch of stuff and uh he was gonna you know refuel on fuel and just uh, everything you know whatever he needed he made a short list grabbed some of the containers he'd need for the gas and stuff and and you know the lantern fluid and all this kind of stuff so he's making his list he's doing his thing and as he's doing so uh he's at the table gathering everything up just going through the checklist make sure he has everything he sees dark shadow on the floor from the two foot by two foot window next to the sink right so he's kind of looking and, and just doing his thing kind of slowed down kind of glancing over at the shadow on the floor and he noticed it's like a man silhouetted moving back and forth doing this little little sway the shadow sway on the floor and he just thought it was the oddest thing and so again he immediately amped up immediately scared however he kept his cool to try to make sure he was seeing what he was seeing and not just seeing things you know so he gingerly reaches down grabs the barrel of the shotgun that was leaning against his little table pulls it up kind of keeping it obscured from whatever's in the window because it was still swaying back and forth the shadow was <laughs> as he's getting the shotgun into position to turn around and point at the window uh the shadow disappears uh, just as he was getting ready to turn all of a sudden the shadow was gone as he turned around there was nothing there right so he's motivated to to get a break he grabs his stuff he loads it up into the old army duffel bag style and slings it over his shoulder has a shotgun and goes on down to the beach now uh, he had had some outboard trouble and so his outboard wasn't attached to his skiff he had worked on it a little bit and it was up in a barrel on a little stand to where he can operate it and make sure it was functioning and he, he had fixed it he just hadn't transferred it from the barrel back onto the skiff and he needed to do so so it was just a little 25 horse motor it wasn't super heavy or anything but he had to use both arms to take it down to the skiff and he wanted to keep it upright so being paranoid and very hyper paranoid at the time he's he's looking all around and you know he's not seeing anything so he you know he loosened up the little cleats that that dig in and he lifts it out and now he's got his bag and the shotgun slung over his shoulder and he's carrying this outboard now he gets down to the shoreline and no issues get climbs down that old driftwood dunnage that he made a little stairway out of and gets down onto the beach and is just set the outboard leaning against the the skiff to attach it to push it out to launch it basically so as he's doing so he set it down leaning against he had to because you know he's packing a, a heavy duffel bag and a shotgun around his neck basically he's taking stuff off to make it a little more comfortable to get the you know do what he has to do with the outboard so according to what he told jonah is is at that point when he leaned the outboard against there and unslung as soon as he unslung the shotgun first and then was in the middle of taking the duffel bag off as soon as the duffel bag gets cleared his uncle got hit in the back of the head with a rock a little bigger than an acorn and he said it hurt bad uh and and didn't understand what the hell he turns around and looks and sees nothing grabs the shotgun 
and shoots a couple rounds up into the trees like you know quit throwing stuff kind of thing because he didn't know what was going on just confusing as hell so he reloads immediately after he shoots those two shots he throws a duffel bag into the skiff and he's having a very hard time reattaching the 25 horse which there's a couple cleats on the back that hook onto the transom and then you have these little dials that you turn down and tighten it down right so he gets it on there and he's tightening him down but he can't focus fully on that because he keeps looking behind him because he was just hitting the head with the rock now according to what was said is he got it fully attached and was getting ready to attach the gas line from the fuel can to the outboard so he could fire it up once he launched it so as soon as he gets this gas line hooked up there's a loud scream from behind him uh, the way Jonah expresses his uncle's eyes would get really big and and he would imitate uh, his chest vibrating from this this growl scream thing that was going on it sounded like directly behind him he said his uncle turned around uh, scared as shit and saw nothing it, it whatever made the noise wasn't as close as it sounded it was it was in the tree line still so and his uncle suspected because he had been popping shots you know anytime something got super crazy you know his, his uncle was popping shots uh right wrong or indifferent that's just what was going on so scared to death re you know make sure everything's attached make sure everything you know the outboard's tightened down to the transom and uh starts to launch the skiff now it was about 25 feet from the tie uh where the water was at that point so he starts pushing it pushing it and he had already dropped the anchor line so once he launched it it would go out catch that anchor line and swing the ass in around and he'd pull it back in to where the outboard's in the deeper water and he could drop it start it get the bow line and, and get out of there anyway so he gets it launched and the whole time it was really hard because he kept getting distracted by what's going on around him he could hear thrashing at this point he could hear weird noises he can't account for so once he's got it launched got it turned around and everything he pulls it back up to shore and there was about 10 feet of this rope that he had a bowline tied to another bowline to where because he kept one anchor on shore buried deep as a just a shoreline and the other one he would just tie a bowline just to keep it so he didn't have to pull in 80 feet of line every time he was coming and going right he could easily do it from in the water he can untie it bring it back out you know and not be worried about you know keeping track of all this line well as he gets in the skiff he hasn't dropped a kicker down into the water yet because he hadn't had a chance he just launched it so he's make sure everything's good it was a nice slack tide so he didn't have waves pushing the boat sideways onto shore or anything like that it was just sitting nice and steady where it was at and so he unties that line and throws it and goes back and drops the kicker down and starts pulling on it and it's making that two stroke la, 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 la. you know anyone who's been around an outboard knows exactly what I'm talking about and <clears throat> as it's as he's doing that every time he pulled it he heard what he thought was an echo of that from the shoreline so he, he was assuming because it was so quiet he was able to hear an echo from <laughs> pull pull starting this two stroke right so he blah 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 and then he would hear blah 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 it, it was identical to the noise the outboard was making and then the the third pull it, it start it sputtered a little bit and then stalled out and there was no echo so he stopped and he was like that's weird so he turned and looked at the, where the trail comes down and meets meets the beach and where that uh, driftwood dunnage was that he made in a kind of like a quasi stairway there was this thing squatted down looking right at him and immediately uh he said he felt like uh, he was having heart palpitations like he was going to have a heart attack he was he couldn't believe what he was seeing he said this thing was squatted down and was still taller than him uh, couldn't make out the face just because of the way the the sun was hitting everything this thing and part of the trail was obscured silhouetted uh, it was it was light out it just this thing was in silhouette and he only saw part of the hand in clear daylight 
and the hair was uh, that cinnamon kind of brownish orange color and he said the hand was huge however the thumb was further set further set down like uh, very similar but not the same as a human's hand and said they just looked monstrously large he's went up and down this trail so many times over the years he knows the width of the trail is you know three and a half foot wide you know the brush starts another 10 foot on each side from that and he said this thing was filling a good portion of that area squatted down looking right at him so immediately he redoubles efforts to start the kicker well one thing he didn't do was prime the little ball on the gas line so he basically got in dropped it and started pulling because of the weirdness going on he he totally spaced priming it so he pulls the choke and then it dawns on him oh i need to prime it so he turns around and starts squeezing a little priming ball right and as he's doing so he's trying to ignore what he just saw up on the beach it just he's trying to deny the existence of what's going on over here so he can start the boat and get out of there and as he's priming the ball it uh it started throwing little pebbles at him in, in a weird case it, he said it would be one two one two so it was like throwing two pausing throwing two more and he's he can catch the motion and not the exact everything going on but he was catching the motion out of his peripheral vision of this going on and it almost felt like this thing he said uh was playing a game with him um a game of let me scare you almost uh, of course it's all subjective it's it's what he felt at the time you know so we're, we're just going by that he primes it starts the outboard and immediately puts it in reverse and backs away from shore well it stalled out because it hadn't warmed up so he put it back in neutral started it back up fired right up he let it idle a little bit and since he got some distance from shore he felt more comfortable looking back at this thing because after the initial noticing it looking at him and whatnot and noticing the hand and all that he immediately averted his eyes he felt like he didn't want to engage it in eye-to-eye -eye contact so as he backed away he gets back up to the bow of the skiff where his shotgun was and picks up the shotgun and is holding it looking back well this thing wasn't where exactly where it was it had backed up the trail a little ways to where it was more obscured in silhouette of the shadows of the trees and stuff the way the sunshine was coming down so he yells out, leave me alone, leave me alone. Now, after he does that, he it's, it's dead quiet. It's still there, but dead quiet. And then all of a sudden, he hears his voice come back at him, leave me alone, leave me alone. So this thing imitated the, the starting of the outboard. It imitated his voice. He said it sounded like himself, like he was listening to a recording of himself. He said it was the oddest shit. Well, he's already offshore. The, the kicker's warming up. He just throws it in gear and heads back to see family. Uh, he had since long ago uh, sold this property. Um, couldn't go back to it. Uh, went back twice after this incident. Uh, just more of the same high strangeness. No more visual sightings, but slapping of the walls. Uh, all sorts of stuff. The, the last trip there, you remember I was telling you that, that sighting? that he used a slab wood siding at about the 10 foot level off the ground it was like every two feet something came through and just punched a hole through that slab which takes a lot of force he said it looked like a small wrecking ball was just boom every two feet boom all the way around that place and that was his last trip there uh his trip was very short that trip because when he got there he had noticed the damage immediately when he got up there looked at it and said no and just walked out didn't didn't grab any more of his stuff he had nothing of real value he was just going to go through and double check on that trip before selling the property he let the people know there's some craziness going on over there just know what you're buying and whoever ended up buying didn't seem to give a flying rat's butt about what he was talking about probably didn't believe him but Anyway, I want to thank Jonah for reaching out initially last year to share this.